Hello and welcome to Advances and Emergent Needs in Paleo Geoscience Cyber Infrastructure, a webinar series organized by C4P. C4P, Collaboration and Cyber Infrastructure for Paleo Geosciences, is an EarthCube research coordination network supported by the National Science Foundation. I'm Doug Phils and I will be the moderator today. Leslie Shee will be running the WebEx. In today's talk, we have two presentations each 20 minutes with roughly 10 minutes for questions. We want to keep this to an hour, so I'll be fairly strict about enforcing time limits, and we'll give each speaker a three-minute warning. If you have questions, please send them through the WebEx chat window, and Leslie will read them aloud after each presentation. You may send in a question at any time. All presentations and follow-up discussions will be publicly archived on the EarthCube website and at the C4P YouTube channel at youtube.com slash cyber for paleo. Our first speaker today is Mark Bion of George Mason University, who will be speaking about the paleobiology database. Our second speaker is David Anderson with NOAA's National Climatic Data Center, speaking about the World Data Center for Paleoclimatology. We'll begin with Mark Ewan. Welcome, and you may begin at any time. Thanks much, appreciate being here. Um, so it's only 20 minutes, so I'll get right started. And first I want to just note that the Paleobiology Database is a really large project with a lot of people involved. And my role is as the Executive Committee Chair. And so the Executive Committee makes decisions about how the database is going to proceed and policy decisions, but there's a whole host of other people, including Shannon Peters and his IT team at Madison, University of Wisconsin Madison, really make it run. And uh, as you'll see, I hope, that it's really the contributors of data to the database that really make it what it is. So you can see here on my first slide, the, the real mission statement is kind of grayed out in the back. Uh, it's, it's kind of long, but really our mission is to document all fossil occurrences on the planet, along with other associated data, and to make these data available to everyone. And so we've been striving in, in recent months and years to, to really hit that last one, make, make those data as publicly accessible as we can, and I'll show you some new ways we've been doing it. If you've never been, the website is down here at the bottom, and I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between this presentation and the website, so it may be easier just to watch and then go check it out yourself later, but I'll, by all means, if you have questions, type them in the, in the chat, and we'll answer them when I'm done. So uh, one thing I want to stress is that there are, there are basically two kinds of people who use the database. One are just users, since we make all this data available via the web. You don't have to be logged in or signed up or be a member of the database to, to utilize it. Virtually all the data that's entered is of, as available to people logged in as not logged in. And I will show you the difference between the two. So we recently launched a new tool called Navigator, uh, which is a data visualization and accessing tool. So we'll go check it out right now. So here it is. It takes a little minute to line up. I'm going to get rid of this stuff and go straight to it. So it shows you uh, the world, uh, and you can you can it visualizes all the data in the database at first, and all those dots represent different uh, clusters of collections. So bigger dots mean more collections, smaller dots mean fewer collections, and you can use the map these tools and this time scale to zoom in exactly what you want. So for instance, if you wanted to look at fossils just in the Jurassic, if you click on Jurassic, note all the dots change to this pretty blue uh, and even shades of blue or they all light Jurassic. And if you want to see them in the Jurassic, you can click here and reconstruct it during the Jurassic. That's all Jurassic fossils. If you want to see a certain taxon like Dinosauria, you can do that, select it, and boom, now you have all Jurassic Dinosauria reconstructed in, in the Jurassic. And the thing to note about this is these maps are being drawn dynamically. The paleo plate positions are drawn from G-Plates, a different web service tool, and the data are being drawn from the paleobiology database. And you can even click on them, see a little bit down here in the corner, oops, can't do that, uh, about it, and you click and get a little bit more information. And if you wanted to, you could, in the end, hit this little disk icon and download the data that's shown on this map. So that's one way you can interact with the database without ever being logged in at all. Uh, you can also simply just browse the data. So if you, if you get to this screen, this is, this is a, not, a not logged in text interface. 
you can go here and see exactly the same data. So here it says fossil collection records. I can say give me dinosauria from the Jurassic. And here it comes as text. And it just comes as a list, and you can drill down and see more about each of these different collections with lots more data than you can see in the visualization. But again, this is all available via download without ever logging in. So let me go back to my presentation. Uh, here's just some summary statistics about what's in the database. Uh, we have lots of references, lots of collections, over a million occurrences. Uh, and you can see there that over 387 people have accounts that have entered data into the database. And these numbers change daily, so this is the numbers as of yesterday. Um, this is probably a more interesting statistic. This is output from the database. So as people publish papers, they can log them as official publications if, if they so desire, and we have almost 200 of those now. We also have had Google Scholar look out there what papers are using the database, and we have just shy of 500, probably over that since this was a few days ago, and almost 10,000 citations to those 500 papers. And the database, I'm putting that in air quotes, the database has an eighth index of about 48. And you can see on the bottom our, our citation trend is just on the rise till the present. So uh, this is not really a map of our tables. This is sort of a visualization of the kinds of data that the paleobiology database holds. All of the uh, information is linked to bibliographic sources. So down at the bottom, you see in blue the references. If you had a data set, say, that you were collecting that hadn't been published yet, you could sort of create a fake reference and, and put it in there so that you could use this before you publish as well. But in the end, it, we need a source for the data, and that's what the blue references represent. Then we have taxonomic data of two sorts, which I'll show you, names and opinions, uh, and then a whole bunch of geologic and geographic information about lithology, geography, taphonomy, and stratigraphy, and then in red, the occurrences themselves. And they're all, all those data types are related back to the references, and there's lots of interrelationships among the data that you see here, which I'll show you in just a moment. So again, primarily, it's all based on geographic data, or sorry, bibliographic data, and uh, mostly it's published works, journals, journal articles and books. Again, you can put in a placeholder for unpublished data, and uh, you can actually download all this as a CSV file or CSV file. So I'll show you how this works. To do so, I'm gonna have to log in. I can only get my password right, uh, and I forgot the number. So here's what a reference looks like. Basic uh, information here on what kind of reference, when, who wrote it, title, and the DOI. So um, we're looking to upgrade this uh, input form in a bit, so you may be able to just type in the DOI and have uh, our database go out to uh, indexes out there in the world and bring in that information for you to help save the typing, which is what we're trying to do is streamline the user experience so we minimize the amount of uh, time it takes to input data, which is really, it can be quite time consuming. Taxonomic data is much more interesting. Uh, we have two kinds of data, one on the names themselves and who names them and then opinions about what people have said about those names. So let's take a look at these two names for no particular reason, other than that I'm familiar with them. So here's a name. So we track who said it. This happens to be me uh, and, and the bibliographic information. So you could go back and find this paper and find out exactly uh, whether this was correct. Uh, it is. Then we can also look at opinions about those taxa, like this. So this one, there's only two opinions, the original and this one that just came out, both assigning it to the same family. Here's one that's a little more interesting. In this taxon, it's been assigned to many different families, both this deceit whales and tube whales, and then it's got its own family, but you can see all the different opinions about this one genus and how they've evolved over time. And so in this case, 
The one that's in bold is the one that's actually being used by the database, which is usually the most recent one, not quite here. So the taxonomic information can get very complicated, but it's stored in a very rich way. And you can always go back and reconstruct what anyone's ever said about any given taxonomic name. So the geologic and geographic data is probably the richest data types that we have. And they're all associated with what we call a collection. And it's basically just the intersection of a geographic place with a temporal bound and usually a geologic unit. So we're going to look at this collection. Which happens to be the same collection that the taxon we were just looking at was from. Here's just some basic info. The, there, notice that there's multiple references associated with it because different people have talked about fossils from this one single place. Here's the geographic info with a little map. So as you enter data, you can check to see that your dot is right where you think it should be. Uh, it's real easy to mix up your north, south, east, west and get them across the planet. Here's our information on time and stratigraphy. Uh, we have different ways of entering time and named time intervals. Uh, and there is a, a strict vocabulary for this. It won't let you put in units it doesn't understand. And also direct date methods to put in, uh, or direct date numbers and the methods that are used to assess them. Uh, here's stuff about the lithology and environmental deposition, preservation of the fossils, what's in this collection of fossils, and then here how it was collected and even some about where the collection is stored. And most of these fields or these groups of fields have places to put comments. So if your data doesn't seem to fit in any particular category, you can always add it to the comment field down here. All right, our next data type are occurrence data. We'll look at the occurrences for the same collection here. Uh, and these can be expressed at any taxonomic level down to the species or subspecies and all the way up to any higher, um, higher classification that you might have. And we can keep the track of them as occurrences or numbers of individual specimens, MNIs, all sorts of different ways to track numbers of things. So let's go take a look at that. It won't let me do this without having a reference. So I'm going to grab one. So here's the same collection, but now we're looking at the list of things from that place. And you can see here's some at the subordinal level. Here's a, a, a CF species. And note that in, this is where we also say that it's a new genus, a new species. So you can actually keep track of the type locality, as long as it's indicated here that it's a new genus, a new species, that will get associated with this name and collection number. So you always know with the type locality of any given taxon is as long as that information is entered here. Now, that's how most of the data is entered, and you can also uh, explore it and retrieve it in a bunch of different ways. So all the things I just showed you actually use these search functions to find stuff that was already in there. So uh, we looked at the data entry screens, but actually use the search functions to find them. Um, and all all this information, all these information types can be retrieved by using one of these search functions. So I can even go find, uh, let's go look at um, all the data associated with this family. So I can search for collections of that family. So there's the one we've been looking at, but notice there's a whole bunch of other collections that have uh, fossils that have identified as members of the Xenorophidae, the family that thing. So you could go drill down and look at these. You could download this data, whatever you need to do. Uh, but this is, right now, just a way to browse and look at the data. Um, and you can also use these search functions to look for duplicates. Like, we don't want you to enter the same paper twice. So you use those search functions to see if a paper has already been entered before you enter it again. Now, uh, you can also download the data using very specific functions. So let's go download the data associated with this family. Right here, there's a whole bunch of, depending on what kind of data you want, you hit one of these uh, 
one of these buttons over here will be the occurrences. And notice that you can you can restrict the data uh, in many ways here, and you can actually include lots and lots and lots of different data that we store by going through all the fields here, which I'm not going to do now for time's sake. But here you just hit the Create Data Set button. You're going to get a list of occurrences, ranges, references in two different formats. And here they are. So notice it found six occurrences, four ranges for the different taxa, and then the references in two different formats. So you can download it as RIS and put it right into your bibliographic software to make a bibliography of the data, of, of the papers that were used to create this data set. It's going to be really handy when you're at publication time. And uh, I also wanted to talk just briefly about our API, or Application Programming Interface. This has just recently been released. And the API allows users to access virtually all the public data automatically. You can write scripts that perform um, all these functions I've been using the website for. You can write a script to download the data and then perform analysis on the downloaded data, which is really, really handy. And in fact, you can write apps that use the Paleobiology database. Like, uh, if you've never seen it, there's an, an iPhone app called Mancos, uh, written by Steve Holland and his crew, that draws in ge geologic data and fossil data from TBDB. And you can, you can visualize this data along with the geology right on your iPhone or iPad. It's pretty amazing. We have a lot of other data partners that are using our data, like Encyclopedia of Life, which is currently using our dynamically generated taxonomy on their web pages. And we have many others that are trying to go into them, and other people are coming on board uh, all the time. But every single person on the planet can use this functionality as long as uh, they know how to access the API. And this is explained on our website, how to, how to get at the data and the protocols for doing so. So lastly, I just wanted to close with this uh, sort of musing about cyber infrastructure challenges that we're experiencing right now and some thoughts about what we're doing with them. So data entry takes both time and expertise. You can't just jump into it untrained. And so um, it can take a long time to enter a single paper if there's a lot of fossil appliances in there and a lot of taxonomic opinion. So um, Shannon and his team on a different project uh, has been talking about trying to automate this and having machines actually read papers and format the data or things like Paleobody Database, which might be a huge leap forward for us. Uh, but right now, that's in the testing phase. Uh, again, currently, our unit of entry is an occurrence. We don't track individual specimens, but we're looking to expand uh, our data input to actually take in specimen data. So we might be able to actually import data from museums and, and reformat them into the sort of way we're used to dealing with them. Uh, and some of our data are stored in a quirky fashion because our database started, you know, 12 years ago, more than that. Uh, and so uh, it was done before there were a lot of data entry standards, and some have been set since then, and some have evolved, and PBDB has certainly evolved with it. But, but some of our old legacy data aren't up to current standards, and so we're trying to standardize how we store and exchange data to make it more useful to people who want to draw it, draw it in using our API uh, for whatever purpose they want to use it for. And uh, it's a, I've, I've ended a couple minutes early. I can certainly go on and on, but I'd rather open it up for questions and let you guys uh, ask me whatever you like. And hopefully I can show you what you need to know about either using the database or becoming a member. And if you want to actually enter data, I should say that the easiest thing to do is just email info at paleobiodb.org uh, and send us your CV and what you want to do, and we'll set you up. Thank you very much, Mark. So, again, if you have questions, please uh, go ahead and type them into the chat uh, window, and Leslie will collect those and uh, present them to Mark here. Uh, Leslie, do we have anything to start with? Yes. We do. The first question is, what time frame do you anticipate folding in specimen data related to literature references and other things? Um, we don't have a time frame yet. Um, and we, we do take in some 
kind of specimen data, but we don't use it to construct the current list. Uh, so um, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit, at least a year, I would say, before we're ready to do that. But we're we're exploring options right now, and also exploring using some of the more uh, global universal specimen identifiers as well, so that specimens will be able to be tracked both within our database and other people's databases using the same specimen identifier. So hopefully that will make it much more easy to exchange data among different systems. All right, thanks. This next question is, what are your main channels of user feedback and how do you prioritize? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, usually just via email and conversations with people. So. Um, People, we set up this info at paleobiodb.org email to send general questions to, and that goes to me or Jocelyn Sessa, our secretary, who we're pretty good about either answering them or sending them off to the other executive team members or our IT team if, if they're technical in, in nature and trying to get them answered right away. If, if there's a bug that can be addressed very quickly, we try to do that, but if not, uh, it either goes on our troublesome bug list or our feature request list. And if both of them are pretty long and we have basically uh, two half people, programmers, working on them. So uh, we do our best. And for the most part, what we have works pretty darn well. Uh, but uh, we're always looking for new suggestions for features. Uh, even if they don't come out right away, they're going on our list. Okay, I had a request to read the questions louder. Hopefully this is better. The next question is a little bit related. Uh, when an error is found in the database, who is best to alert the error? The authorizer or the info at email? The, uh, the author or authorizer. Yeah, so every, every record is attached to the person who entered it. Uh, and that's the person we call the authorizer. And it's best to email them directly because they're the people best equipped to fix any any errors. Uh, if you send it to info and that comes on my desk, I'm just going to turn it around and send it to authorize. So uh, that's that's your best your best bet is to go directly to them. Uh, and so you can see their names associated with the record, like here. Let me find one. So there, here, this record for Melvin is associated with me. So you can find a list of everyone in the database in, in our info pages, and you can find their email and send it right to them, and then hopefully we can help you out. Okay, great. Next, um, for the taxonomic opinions, who maintains it? Is it mostly the authors themselves, or are there some authorizers who do most of the work putting this information in? The only people that enter data are authorizers. So the authors themselves, unless they are authorizers, aren't doing that. And this is a, sort of a different feature of the database. A lot of systems have a, a single hierarchy, taxonomic hierarchy sort of imposed on the data, where ours is actually dyna dynamically generated. So let me show you what that means. Since I work on whales, let's look at whales. So here's oh, this. Is, this is a classification of cetacea that it just generated for me on the fly. So there are opinions saying Ambulocetus belongs to Ambulocetus. I didn't tell it that. There's a series of opinions that say that. And so nobody maintains the hierarchy. It just generates itself based on the the most preferred opinions that have been entered. And so sometimes we get a lot of, I get a lot of emails from people saying, oh, I don't like the way this taxonomy looks. And the only answer I have is, if you don't like it, jump in and enter some more data. Because <laughs> that's the only way to make it look any different. OK, the next question is, how did you encourage participation to get the database where it is today with the amount of data that's in it? That's a really good question. And I'll tell you my own personal my own personal reason for entering this data. I've entered all the marine mammals and all the marine birds and all sorts of stuff. And I did it 
for my own personal selfish reasons. I wanted this data in here so I could re-extract it and do interesting science on it. And I figure, why shouldn't keep other people benefit from my time doing the data entry? You know, rather than just put it into a big Excel spreadsheet or some personal database, this way, it's out there, it's available everywhere the web is, and everyone else on the planet can use it. So I think there's as much science that was done on the data I've entered by other people than me. And so I encourage people to enter data for their own selfish reasons, and then you get, there's a lot of added benefit by letting other people use it in ways that you never would have thought of. Or you could generate new collaborations with people who want to use your data in ways that you might not have thought of either. So I think uh, join for selfish reasons, oops, uh, but, but then you get this extra benefit of being a public resource. And I think that's true of most people who are in the database, and this is how we got most of this data. Okay, next question is, are there plans to allow for the batch upload of collection data? Perhaps a digital form that would streamline and minimize data entry error. The data entry process for non-standardized collections, for example, um, collections current, for example, collections currently housed at the Smithsonian. Yes, so that's what I said before about we're looking to enter specimen data. That falls under that category. So yes, we're, we're that is our, the next, great frontier for us is, is getting that in. And we're, we're talking with a couple of different groups that have specimen data about how best to do that. So like I said, it's kind of a big task. So um, it, we hear you. We've heard this from a lot of people, and we're definitely moving in this direction. But it's going to be a little bit until we're, we're ready for prime time like that. OK, that's the last question. Um, right now, nothing else is showing up right now. Okay. So actually, the timing is about perfect. So we'll go ahead and move on to the uh, next presenter, Dave Anderson, on the World Data Center for Paleoclimatology. So we'll pass the ball to you, Dave. Great. How are we doing, Josie? Let's uh, do a sound check. Is my voice okay? Yes, you're doing fine. Great. And uh, can you see a screen labeled World Data Center for Paleoclimatology? I see that, and I see you. Good. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Anderson. I'm the director for the World Data Center for Paleoclimatology at NOAA's National Climatic Data Center in Asheville, North Carolina. This webinar is part of the Research Coordination Network for Paleo Geosciences webinar series. And I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today about the archive uh, at NOAA, which consists of paleoclimate data um, submitted and you know contributed by scientists working at institutions around the world um, based on their published research using some of the proxy types I'll film here. So in this talk this afternoon, I'm going to first begin by answering a question for you. What's in it for me? And I'm going to try to describe um, some of the things in this archive that you might find of interest in your own studies and research um, and data efforts. And uh, then for a moment, we're going to celebrate data intensive science. I'm going to tell you two stories about scientific discoveries that have been made possible by data intensive science. Uh, discoveries that would not have been possible without the archive efforts that we're talking about today. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about, is enabling data-intensive science through the development and the connection of these different archives and different tools. So then I'll, I'll tell you what librarians have known all along, and then I'll talk about some of the challenges for the Paleo Geosciences cyber infrastructure uh, in the last part of my talk. Doug, I am having trouble advancing my screen. There we go. 
Okay, so let's look at the World Data Center uh, for period climatology by the numbers. There are 9,222 different data sets as of yesterday. These have been contributed by 4,362 uh, contributors working at institutions around the world. The paleoclimate community tends to organize or be discipline specific. We call these disciplines proxies. Um, for example, many of the journals are discipline specific, such as the journal paleoceanography. And we recognize 18 different proxy types. The World Data Center is maintained by a staff of six people who operate one World Data Center for NOAA. The archive contains some of the most iconic and well-known data sets documenting climate and environmental change going back over the last several centuries to millions of years. And in the upper left here, you can see the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide measured in ice cores going back over the last several centuries. So this shows the concentration of carbon dioxide in the clean industrial atmosphere as measured by bubbles in ice cores. And on the right, you can see the data sets bearing on the, or revealing the rise in sea level that occurred at the end of the last ice age 21,000 years ago. These data come from all over the world. As I mentioned, they come from about 18 different proxy types. And the list at the bottom shows the last half a dozen um, contributions that have been received over the past several weeks at the World Data Center. One of the biggest problems or limiters in this archive is the file format. We've been in existence since 1991. And over that time, we've collected and archived data sets in different formats. And you can see here two formats or two time series data sets on the lower left of this screen that are in slightly different formats. So all of the information you need is there, sample depth, age, the variable measurements. And if you wanted just one of these data sets, it would be fairly easy to just copy and paste it into Excel or write a MATLAB script to read this data. But if you want tens or hundreds of or thousands of these data sets, it becomes very difficult because the data are unstructured. So we archive data primarily in the format received corresponding to journal article preferences or specialist conventions. We did this in order to follow community standards, but the community standards evolved. We did this so that we could archive more data, and we did this so that we could accept all different data types. But it's a limiter because now the large number of files that one would like to process cannot be processed easily by a computer program. Time-consuming human effort is needed to process each time series. And so in the next slide, I'll show you an example of a structured data file. So in October 2013, just about a half a year ago, we began an aggressive effort to structure the incoming data that we received. And so here's the difference. What you're looking at is uh, what we call a structured data file. There are hundreds of different structures that we could use. We could use NetCDF. Um, we could use XML um, tagging. Um, what we've been doing is structuring the data in an ASCII format here where the uh, metadata are identified by pound signs and identified comment lines. And the important part of this data set here is that there are a series of lines here exposed down at the bottom, beginning with depth, then age. Each line corresponds to a column in the table below. And then the uh, data here are space separated values. So formatted in this way with um, an expected series of nine elements here for each variable, and then the data uh, separated by spaces at the bottom here, it is possible to read one or 10 or 100 or 1,000 of these files and end up with all these files imported into MATLAB or whatever other environment you would like and prepared for analysis. So to the extent we can do this, we enable uh, data, and to the extent that we can structure the data we, um, in this big archive, we enable data intensive science. So in the next part of my talk here, I'm gonna tell you two stories or examples about how data intensive science serves as a complement to laboratory and field-based investigation, and really stands up there as a premier way of hypothesis testing and scientific problem solving. And the examples I want to show you are examples where 
scientific discoveries have been made that would not have otherwise been possible without uh, a data intensive or without an archive effort. So the first example I'm going to describe is the case where scientists have reused hundreds of proxy time series and weather measurements originally collected for other purposes, and this enables the reconstruction of global surface temperature. And then I'll also uh, describe how additional measurements can be used to reduce the uncertainty in these uh, temperature reconstructions. And the second example I'll describe is the case where radiocarbon measurements originally used to date samples are now used to trace atmospheric and ocean circulation, which moves carbon between reservoirs once independent dating is provided. So this first example relates to the hockey stick. This is the time series of global temperature here, spanning the interval from the present going back to 1000 AD. The ordinate here are uh, departures from average temperature here. The red show the recent thermometer-based record. And you can see here this, what's been described and debated on the Senate floor as the hockey stick reconstruction of global temperature. The blade of the stick here being the uh, um, warming that's occurred in the last 100 years and contrasting with this handle of the hockey stick, this gradual cooling that's occurred, um, cooling trend that's occurred over the last 1,000 years. These reconstructions were made possible by the International Free Room Data Bank, which was a comp compilation of time series with sufficient spatial coverage and extent back in time to allow the global surface temperature to be reproduced. This would not have been possible without an archive. And these data, especially these tree ring data, were not initially collected to reconstruct Earth temperature. The other point I would make about this, you can see here that the uncertainty is indicated in this um, early figure. This is probably from a decade ago. But you can see here that the uncertainty is indicated by the gray bars here. And you can see how the uncertainty or the envelope of gray um, uh, increases going back in time. And the exciting thing here is that data intensive efforts and the compilation of additional data allow this uncertainty to be um, reduced by collecting and adding more data. And this, of course, allows us to make uh, scientific conclusions that are more helpful for decision makers and policy making. The second example I want to talk about is uh, radiocarbon. So we're all familiar with the exponential decay of radiocarbon and the concept that by measuring the activity of radiocarbon in a geologic sample, we can use that remaining activity to understand the sample age here. What's exciting is that with independent age control, we can determine additional information. So this graph here shows um, the age of a sample determined independently. In this case, the sample dated was a, a ring uh, from a tree. So the age is determined by the ring rule, and the age is also determined by the radiocarbon measurement. And you can see here in this correspondence, there are time intervals that are either too old or too young. These are times when the initial activity of radiocarbon in the sample was either a little more or a little less than this long-term average. So with this independent age control, the radiocarbon age can be used to identify changes in the initial radiocarbon activity. This provides evidence of changes in the concentration related to the magnetic field variation um, and related to the changing uptake of radiocarbon by, between the ocean and the atmospheric reservoir. So this is another case where data originally connect, collected for one purpose have been reused to make new scientific discoveries that would have not been possible without this data intensive effort. So now I want to talk about something that librarians have known all along, and that is that catalogs help people find things. Catalogs provide multiple ways to search by author, by keyword, by location. Catalogs provide an inventory. Catalogs assist the user with choices. And I want to read to you here this description of um, online cataloging from Wikipedia, because the author of this paragraph understood the power and the 
helpfulness of setting rules and making agreements between different organizations in the development of this catalog. So online cataloging through such systems as Dynex Software Vault in 83 and used widely throughout the 1990s has greatly enhanced the usability of catalog thanks to the rise of MARC standards, machine-readable cataloging, in the 1960s. Rules governing the creation of MARC catalog records include not only formal cataloging rules, but also rules specific to MARC, available from both the U.S. Library of Congress and the Online Computer Library Center, Global Cooperative, which builds and maintains WorldCat. So there's a parallel here, or a, uh, a moral for us in the paleogeosciences, that the online cataloging that so successfully used by library systems leaned heavily on the adoption of some standards and rules um, in order to build these interoperable catalogs. So I want to talk a little bit about what makes a good catalog entry for paleo geosciences. This is kind of down into the detail. Um, it's the technical part of our talk where we, um, where we look at some suggestions kind of of what's worked for us in archiving paleo data. So what makes a good catalog entry for paleo geosciences? For all digital objects, there's a sturdy definition, um, enough information so that the object can be found and its suitability for use determined. And I would add that catalog entries should also have enough information to credit the author successfully. For the paleo geosciences, where many of the data sets are geospatially referenced, in other words, um, they refer to samples that have a latitude and longitude, the FGDC content standard is a good thing to aim for. And I just want to um, draw your attention here to the FGDC standard for metadata's seven elements. There is an element for identification information, an element for data quality, two elements related to the spatial data uh, organization and the reference. There is um, information related to entities and attributes, what was measured. There's information on the distribution of the data, how to get the data, and there's information on how the metadata was created. So there are many different standards, FGDC is only one, and crosswalking metadata refers to finding common elements and then translating between different content standards, such as FGDC, ISO 19115, the NASA DIFF standard, and uh, Dublin Core, although uh, Dublin Core in its um, skinniest version does not have spatial information. So it's not essential for all of us to use the same standard. But a common level of richness and common granularity is good. In other words, if some of us um, decide to have a level of richness that includes keywords and some of us do not, um, this will make a distributed or uh, um, shared catalog uh, less useful if the level of richness varies from one provider to another. And then likewise, if some of us describe data sets at a collection level and others describe data sets at a very fine sample level, that makes the um, combined catalog less useful. And then finally, as a goal to reach for in developing these interoperable catalogs, the use of common vocabulary, for example, a thesaurus for keywords, adds power to the distributed catalog that we're trying to create. So, this is a scary figure showing all of the different fields associated with Section 1 and the FTDC uh, content standard. And so some of these content standards can be extensive. And at the World Data Center, we have tried to draw a, a kind of a happy medium between the level of detail that we can achieve and the number of data sets that we are able to archive. Because in addition to being reasonably complete with our description, we also want to archive or as much data as we can. So one of the other issues in developing a catalog is uh, what level to um, identify items, or in other words, what, at what level to make the catalog entry. So on the left here is a site level catalog entry for the Indo-Pacific warm pool seawater uh, O18 estimates. So in general, the data archived at the World Data Center are at this site level. Um, in other words, one data set description refers to a single site or a group of sites associated with a publication. On the right is an example of a collection level data set description from the NASA Global Change Master Directory. So this is a collection um, 
Global Historical Climatology Network, consisting of maybe 3,200 different sites. And because it's a collection level record, the individual site location is uh, not shown. It's, it's not mappable. So just to reiterate, at the World Data Center, most of the data set descriptions are at the site um, level corresponding to a core location or a study level corresponding to a publication. And we have adopted this level of granular of granularity because it helps to ensure that the individual contributors will be credited and it responds to the dominant use cases that we get, such as what data do you have for Bostock, the ice core site, or what data do you have in my region? Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about my vision or my idea of building an interoperable shared catalog and where the challenge lies. So what I am hoping is that all of us data providers can build a catalog that harvests catalog elements from other catalogs in order to meet the needs of our user community. For example, for the paleoclimatology community that I serve, the data of interest for my users includes probably all of the data in the World Data Center archive, and probably some of the data in Paleo Portal, some of the data in the paleobiology database that we just talked about, and some of the data from the National Small and Ice Data Center. In fact, my user community might hope that I would harvest some data set descriptions from CLIVAR, the climate variability um, study, in order to make this catalog of elements bounded by the red line that they see. And similarly, CLIVAR might harvest several of the records from the World Data Center that have um, specific climate variables reconstructed, such as precipitation and temperature. And similarly, paleobiology might want to harvest several catalog descriptions from the World Data Center. So some of the issues in achieving this interoperable shared catalog are that we need to agree on a convention for metadata content. We need some interim agreement on harvest and provide protocols. For example, would we all agree to use web accessible folders containing Dublin Core metadata as a content standard? This would, agreement will go away in the future as technology advances, but right now if we wanted to implement an interoperable data catalog tomorrow, making some of these agreements will help, just as it helped the library community. And then I think yeah, similar absolutely. granularity will help. Okay, I think the last challenge I want to describe is um, our effort to encourage the community to identify better what was measured. And so we are focusing on nine elements that we think are standard for each variable. So now we're going past the metadata to talk just about when we receive a time series or a measurement, what things do we need to know so that to enable reuse of that measurement and enable the combinings of things that were measured in the same way. We think we need to know what the measurement is, what material it was measured on, um, we have uh, an error quantity here that identifies whether this variable is an error term or not. We need to know the units. Um, we also modify these variables if uh, there is a particular seasonality that was um, uh, reconstructed. We identify the archive according to one of these 18 different proxy types. We have a category for um, detail, which includes terms or phrases used to modify or describe how the raw data has been altered, resampled or normalized, or to specify whether the certain material was a size fraction, which is 150 to 212 micron. We need information on the method, how the analysis was made, and um, to make it machine readable, we need to know the data type, whether it's character or numeric. And this is kind of evolving. I think this is really the the difficult place right now for all the different archives is to agree on what level of detail is needed to identify what was measured. Okay, my last slide is just to um, give you a scorecard on how we're doing. So what I've done here is to look at a couple of different aspects of maturity for the different paleogeosciences archives. Um, and this is just off the top of my head for discussion, looking at how we're doing, how AIDA, Janus, Macrostrat, Neotoma, Pangea, Paleobiology, Paleoportal, and some of the other data archives that are discussed in the webinar series are doing in five different categories. Do they have a catalog? Can that catalog be harvested? And I've scored these one to three from weakest to best, looking at 
whether the data are freely available and whether sufficient ancillary data is archived, looking at how they credit scientists, looking at whether they structure the data, and looking at how they treat age information. And I just want to point out for now um, that there are two weaknesses, I think, as we look across all these different archive efforts. And one is that we haven't yet achieved this interoperable shared catalog. Um, and so I've highlighted that in red. And then second, we've been, um, our standard and our efforts in archiving age information has varied as we've gone through time. I think all of us would agree that the holy grail is to have sufficient age information that we can redo age models. And um, in many cases, we haven't collected enough information to make that possible. So I think I'll stop there um, by thanking the thousands of scientists who have taken the time to contribute their data and make it available to others uh, and take questions from the audience. Dave, Leslie, I'll go ahead and pass to you for questions. Sure. Thanks, Dave. Um, okay. Related to this last slide, the first question is, who puts the data into the structured data file, and is it hard to make people use it? Yeah, this is a really tough question. So right now, we are trying aggressively to structure the data for the community. So, um, you know, October 2013, somebody could send us a file in any format, and we would work it around to a structured format. Um, we cannot do this with all the world's paleoclimate data. So what we're trying to do is a gradual evolution where the effort to structure data files and really the the structure um, that's selected by is selected by the community. So we're hoping that the community will identify the structure and then over time we'll begin to structure the data in the format that they would like to see. Yep. Okay, thanks. The next question do you have any challenges dealing with very large data sets or ongoing continuous data sets? Uh, we might have to refine ongoing continuous because I'm not sure what was meant there. Um, we we do for sure receive updates to data sets. Um, that's that's routine. The metadata identifies the updates, um, so that's straightforward. Large data sets. Um, we're lucky because we're part of NOAA, which is a satellite heavy organization, and NOAA is used to dealing with very large data sets. So theoretically. Um, we've been able to piggyback on NOAA resources and NOAA solutions for archiving large data sets and archive, and in that way, archive transit model simulations and other full climate data. Okay, for the continuous data sets, um, what was meant was sensors that are continuous and continuously collecting data. But I think you addressed that by the updates to existing data sets. Right, right. There, yeah, to try to elaborate a little bit, there is a loose division. Like, what is the, in the world of climate data, what is the purview or what is the mandate of the World Data Center? And in general, we do not archive uh, modern monitoring data unless it relates to calibration of paleo samples, and we do not archive instrumental data. The World Data Center's mission is to archive data derived from paleo proxy measurements including historical records such as Ben Franklin's diary. Okay, great. The next question is, can you explain more about how you maintain your keyword list? Uh, I think the question was to explain how we maintain our keyword list. Um, uh, we are, our keyword list is very immature. Um, we branched off from a NASA Global Change Master Directory thesaurus for paleoclimate data. We modify that to associate keywords with 18 different proxy types. But we are really eager to work with the Research Coordination Network for Paleo Geosciences. And at the end of our two-year effort, I think that we'll have a much better and sturdy set of keywords and a thesaurus that everybody can use. And I don't think we have that now. Next question is, given how popular the topic of climate is among non-scientists, is there an effort to help 
beginner non-domain users or help them use the data correctly? Yeah, um, there are several approaches to this. The most fundamental approach for many people delivering things over the web is uh, an approach called laddering, where you try to provide relatively easy information, kind of low rungs of the ladder, where any user can get on and kind of see what, what's going um, or understand a topic. And then later they can um, go up the ladder toward uh, of increasing complexity and find more refined information, ultimately pointing to scientists and their data set. So we have tried to ladder information on NOAA themes such as global warming, drought, and abrupt climate change and provide both this easy to access information and also up the ladder this access to scientists. The ultimate objective in doing this, and I would encourage all of the paleo geosciences um, participants and archives to do this, is to connect data, people, and publications. And I think that's going to provide the really rich uh, environment that our users will find most helpful. And so just to be really concrete here, what we're trying to do, when you Hit a data set, you should also be able to connect with the OC, um, ORC ID number of the scientist or the contributor and then be connected to that person. Likewise, you should be able to click on the DOI and be connected to that publication. If we do this right in a couple of years, when you go to a particular investigator, you'll be able to find his publications and his data sets. And likewise, when you go to a set of publications, you'll be able to find the the scientists and the data associated with that publication. So we are working toward building a really rich network that's going to serve user needs on several levels by connecting data, people, and publications. Thanks. The next question, well, first a comment. Jack Williams really enjoyed your talk. And his question is, what would you say are the immediate actions to take at our May workshop? I'm wondering specifically about agreeing to standards for joint cataloging and harvesting across resources. I think that's a great goal, and, and I bet uh, we can do it through the May workshop. I didn't realize that until Mark's talk minutes ago that he had a API for us to pick up the catalog descriptions from paleobiology. So that's really exciting, and I would say to all of us, we're closer than we think to creating this interoperable catalog. Um, so I think that's a great goal for the May workshop. I will reiterate the other goal that I presented just because it's such a challenge. Um, and that is we need to do better at identifying what was measured. And the standard that we should strive is when we archive a measurement, we should provide sufficient information to know whether how that measurement was made and whether it can be combined with like measurements or whether it needs to be distinct because the method was different or the, the some aspect of the sample was different. Until we do that, I'm, I'm at risk, we are at risk of building a large archive of data where we don't have enough information about what was measured to use that, to reuse that data. Radiocarbon is a pretty good example of where they did provide enough information to reuse the data later. So standing on that as a, as a good stepping stone is a place to start. Okay, thank you. Um, we have no further questions at this time, but you can always send an email uh, to cyber4paleo, so number four, cyber4paleo at gmail.com, or either of the speakers or the steering committee. And we will be sure to put the Q&A posted up along with this video of the talk. So, Doug? Thank you, Leslie, and also thank you very much, Mark and Dave, for wonderful presentations today. Uh, the webinar series will be available later, both at the EarthQ website and the C4P YouTube channel, which is also youtube.com cyber for paleo, that's with the number four. For future webinars, please check the C4P webinar schedule at the earthcube.org site. Thanks for attending, and take care.